changes anything. Um, but I did want to throw that out there because we did receive some questions in some emails about that. So I wanted to address that. Um, so um, Scott, could you kind of walk us through visually? I, I just, I need to see maps, okay? So there, there were lots of suggestions um, about moving people that uh, in some of the newer areas of Siena, instead of sending Schiff over to Hightower, what, what would that look like? What would that involve? Is it, is it doable? Is it, are, are we just creating a nightmare? Because, yes, new areas of Siena. So we looked at, in the original option one, we looked at aligning Heritage Rose with Hightower, which does contain many of the new areas of Siena. Um, some of the issues of that was when we went down 521, it brought our socioeconomic disadvantage numbers at Ridge Point down to 10%. And so this option brings it down to 16. It didn't bring it down as, you know, it doesn't bring it down as bad as it was in, in that scenario. Uh, we did talk about in some of the focus groups, the ideas of having some detached zones. So you would basically have an island of that growth area that would be zoned to a different school. And it just was not well supported in those focus group sessions. So what would that look like? Can you can you point to that map and say, okay, this this might be one of those areas and within Siena, not you know, not necessarily yeah. Heritage Rose. So um, it it would be the you know some of the areas south here around Thornton. Okay. And so these are areas again that are that are you know close to Ridge Point that you know we we depending on where that school is could be could be walkable. It could not. I mean, those are just some some areas that we could that we could look at, but. Again, it's, it, we're then taking kids all the way either down 521 or up Siena Parkway. And so it's, again, I think it's distance again. Unfortunately, it's, it's gonna be distance no matter which areas are moved just right. because of where our student population, our growth is and where our facilities are. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I'm addressing some of the, some of the things that we've been, we've been reading. And um, I just wanted to see what, again, what that would look like. I, th I know we, we did see that when you presented the original options a month ago, but, you know, we've all kind of slept since then. And, and you know, it's, uh, we don't have, always have direct access to you. So, um, so the, the other question, concern is, um, if we go forward with this plan, there are students, well, actually the question would be, First, um, first Colony Middle School. There were a lot of uh, shift students uh, that had gone to First Colony. And I can't remember if it was that whole boundary, the whole shift boundary, or part of it. Can you remind me? Uh, so that area that, that was going to First Colony last year was, was this area that is in, in shift north of the Fort Bend Toll Road. And there's actually, I believe, a little piece of Heritage Rose that was in that, in that feeder as well. So was it basically the whole shift boundary then? Yes. Okay. Okay, so at the time, which ended last year, so this is the first year that there aren't any shift students in First Colony Middle School. Correct. Okay. So, um, of course, then the concern is, <coughs> excuse me, is that um, there may have been someone last year who was a sixth grader or a seventh grader at First Colony, and I know some of them actually wanted to stay, but um, but most of them probably went back to Baines, and the concern is that now they're going to get moved to Hightower. So could you address that? So if they, were in, if they were in sixth grade last year, they would have been in First Colony. Right. This year they would be in Baines. Next year they'd be in Baines. And then the following year they would be in high tower, and so it would be a change at a natural high school transition. Okay. Okay. And I understand I, what you're saying. Yes. It's not I, what some people, you know. And, and I, again, I understand. Nobody wants to move. Okay, I get it. Um, but it's not like you know they were already at Ridge Point and now they're getting pulled out of there. So, right. I mean, I, I understand they did go through a move, you know, so, you know, but they also all went together, right? 
with with their you know colleagues from elementary school correct okay okay thank you thank you mr rosenthal mrs tossan thank you mr burdeen so just to follow up on that line of questioning we're we're talking about the C, not heritage rose students but the Siena South, the new build in Siena South, that was discussed in the focus groups. Yes. And what was the feedback? That it was a that it was a detached zone. That we'd have we'd have a little island boundary where we'd have kids going, and it would be discontiguous. Do we know how the numbers? Do we know how many kids we would be essentially bussing out from Siena South? Um, I'd have to. I don't have it at the tip of my brain. I can. I can get it during closed session, possibly. Okay. I'd like to know what the numbers are. Um, so I I agree with Ms. Helliger that per policy programs are portable. So um, I understand wanting to raise uh, enrollment at Willow Ridge High School. I understand wanting to address that. Um, and, and I see the percentages going up a little bit, um, but I don't like talking about academies in a school when we talk about rezoning. Um, because as much as I know the Hightower community wants them to stay, um, it has always been board policy that programs are portable and these academies are portable. So, um, so I guess, you know, I'd like to, I may need to look at those numbers again to see what the impact is. I know that we're discussing bringing programming into Willow Ridge High School in order to address some of the enrollment concerns. So I probably, I, I'd like to see what impact we think that's going to make um, on the Willow Ridge uh, enrollment numbers, utilization numbers, I guess. And um, this is why, so I asked a question about what our plan for programming is at the high school level and part of the reason I asked that is because I know that we have Marshall and Willow Ridge that are currently underutilized. I know that the plan is to bring programs in there. If there are plans to bring additional programs in, I think not only do we need to know about it, but the community needs to know about it and we need to know what the impact is going to be. So. Um, so I know that's that's mixing things a little bit because we're looking at zoning and we have you know we're programs are portable but at the same time if we are not gonna make drastic moves to bring enrollment up or utilization up at those two schools um, then I think we need to know what the plan is so that was more of a statement than a question but I'd like to look at that before I vote on this um, there were questions about students that remained at First Colony Middle School in the past. We have allowed those students to attend Elkins High School in order to stay in the feeder um, with the First Colony Middle School kids. Are we going to continue doing that next year and in the future, future years? That is something that we can address through administrative regulations, yes ma'am, um, and provide that opportunity again, similar to the siblings that may be at a campus by um, addressing that through review of utilization at that campus. If there's uh, space and capacity, we've met with the Department of Student Affairs and run through that scenario to see if that's an option that we can um, provide and we will be able to. So I would support that we've done it in the past and i think it's only fair to continue doing it as long as those students i mean we allowed them to remain there i think that makes sense for them to stay with that cohort um, i saw the policy um, the proposed policy change related to siblings and i heard you say that um, rising ninth graders who have siblings at their current high school would be able to stay um, with their siblings, but for next year only. Was that, was that correct? Rising ninth graders for the first year of implementation, yes, but they could remain through their high school. Sure, career. but, but we, that policy would only be for the, for the first year of implementation. Correct. So I would like to 
propose or suggest, and I'd like to see what impact the numbers would have if there are siblings currently okay. rising 10th, 11th, and 12th graders at the existing high school, allowing siblings to make that, to stay at that high school for the next three years. If their siblings are there now, and whether they're a rising ninth grader next year or the following year or the following year. Okay. I would like to see what the impact on those numbers are going to be because it, it, to me it's no different. If you have, a, you have a rising sophomore next year and then you have a sibling who's, a rise, who's not going to quite be there for a couple of years and that sibling's going to be, that older sibling's going to be a senior, when that younger sibling comes in in ninth grade, I still think that's keeping the family together and I would want to see that happen. We can review so that I data. I want to see those numbers, please. Yes, ma'am. Um, so we've talked a lot about the eco dis numbers, um, the economically disadvantaged numbers, and that's something that I am very concerned about. And I did not um, like the idea or the thought of going down 521 and rezoning kids who are economically disadvantaged just because they don't live in Siena. I will say that. I have stated that <coughs> publicly many times. I don't think it's right, and it also happens to be against policy. Um, so uh, Siena Plantation is a master plan community. It is not a neighborhood. Um, we do everything we can to keep neighborhoods together. At the high school level, you can't have neighborhood high schools because they're, they're too big. Um, it's too hard to do. We, do. we do that at the elementary level and as much as we can at middle school, but doesn't quite work as well at the high school level. Um, those of you sitting in the audience who know me know that I live in the area. My kids were zoned to Heritage Rose. They went to Heritage Rose. Um, there were a lot of people that we had to rezone into Heritage Rose who didn't want to go there because they thought it was a low-performing school and it wasn't up to par. Um, and guess what? It is up to par. I had a gifted child there. I had a special needs child there. I had a regular ed child there. We have the principal, one of our principals of the year there. We have excellent staff there. But we have kids who struggle. And so the, the school appears to be um, a low performing school so it's something that I really take to heart um, honestly I don't want to move any kids I mean if I had my way I don't want to move any kids but I had to vote a couple of years ago to move my own child from one middle school to another middle school so I get it I really do I get it it's not something you want to do I had to go home and tell her she was moving and it's not an easy thing to do. But at the same time, when we put the high school in the bond, everybody knew we were gonna have to rezone temporarily at Bridgepoint. We have to rezone. And then when, the, when, as Oscar says, we're gonna get the high school up as quickly as we can, and then all of these boundaries are gonna be impacted again. So no matter what we do, we're gonna have to come back. Is that right? We're going to have to do this again? Yes. When the new high school opens and when the new elementary school opens at Aliana. And when probably a new middle school has to open. That's right. And then we have a new elementary school that's coming in the um, Fort Bend Toll Road area that's going to impact even further <coughs> the elementary school boundaries. So looking out, I just see that we're going to have to move boundaries again. And if these are going to be temporary until we can get the high school open, and then we're going to have to we're going to have to look at it holistically again. Um, so I just wanted to say that because that's my mindset when I'm looking at this. If I had, you know, if we could put um, 50 more portables on there and just let everybody stay where they are, uh, that would be great. But it's not safe. And um, I noticed that your utilization numbers for future do not even i mean even, no when when we looked at utilization that took into account temporary capacity that doesn't talk about whether our cafeterias can hold those students or our hallways 
Um, I have two at Ridgepoint, and it, and it can't. I mean, if you walk down those hallways, there, it's very very difficult. So that I mean, so it didn't take into account those common areas. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, I know I had a couple other questions. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and pass to Mrs. James, and then when I find them, I'll come back. Thank you. Mrs. James? Thank you. I know your comments and your ideas will come back to you. Yes, they will. I'm sure. I might remind you of a couple. Um, okay, so I appreciate all my colleagues and their comments, and I appreciate it also the presentation. Um, so I'm just going to follow up sort of from things that I've heard my colleagues say and ask you just to clarify. So one thing is um, Ms. Hellinger talked about the neighborhoods that are right close to Hightower High School. One of the names is Winfield Lakes, I think she said, and what was the other neighborhood name? Cambridge Falls. Cambridge Falls. Okay, and are those, um, there's a road there that goes uh, perpendicular to Hurricane Lane. I don't, I can't remember the name of it. I think you said it in the beginning. Tramel Fresno. Okay, and so that's the that's the barrier that or the road that the these kids are currently have the opportunity to bus um, to High Tower in this neighborhood. Is that correct? I believe so. Yes. Okay, and so that's why we're saying that even though they're very close in proximity, um, that's not a new bus route, technically. Correct. Okay. And how many students are in, in those neighborhoods? Oh, give me just a second. So Parks is 623 high school kids today. The entire boundary. Okay. I don't have it for the broken out by by those neighborhoods, but I can pull it out of the aggregate. Okay. So it's not the entire uh, Rosa Parks Elementary School boundary. It's just a portion of it. No, that's the whole Rosa Parks Elementary School boundary. The whole Rosa Parks Elementary boundary includes 693 students, and it's all of those. Um, it's both of those neighborhoods, and that's it. No, there's also additional area as well. Okay, so I, I'm gonna need a little more clarification and, and, and time to study that. Um, and this probably brings up my next, my next point, and that has to do with feeder pattern splits. So I see on our papers on the table that there's some charts around that, but I have not had time to look at that. I've also noticed that in the, uh, information talking about alignment with our board policy it doesn't talk about feeder pattern splits but I do believe that is part of our FC local um, policy so I do need to look at that and that's going to be important in my decision because uh, these kids need to not go off in small cohorts um, to middle school in my opinion um, So that brings me to some of the things Mr. Rosenthal was talking about, about Schiff Elementary. So I need some clarification on that. Is the whole of Schiff Elementary School moving to the high tower attendance zone? Yes. Okay. And the whole of Schiff, of the whole of Schiff has been at Elkins? No. They have been at they were at First Colony until Thorntonville opened. They have always been at Ridge Point. High school. So they were, they were at, they were at, they were Schiff, Baines, Ridge Point, then Schiff, First Colony, Ridge, Ridge Point. Point. Now they're Schiff, Baines. I, well, first they were Schiff, Baines, Ridge Point. Yes. 
and now their shift now they this proposal is shift Baines High Tower. Correct. All right, and how large of a school is Schiff? So roughly how many kids are in a fifth grade class? It is 425 high school students, approximately 107 per class. That doesn't make sense. I'm so, so the, the Schiff neighborhood is 425 high school students today. The, the Schiff zone, if we're looking at it just as a geographical unit. And at four classes, it's about 107 per class. Okay, but there's there's six grades at a... I'm, talking, I'm just talking high school. No, I'm talking about how many kids are moving from fifth grade to sixth grade at a time. That's what I'm asking you. I think it's in the neighborhood of probably 175 or 200. No, it can't be right. It's got to be like 80 or 90. Okay. Okay. Well, I would like to know, I'd like to get some accurate information on that because I don't, I, 427 divided by 6 is, gives you 75, not yeah. 107. That, that 400, no, that 425 is grades 9, 10, 11, and 12. That's where I got the, the 112. She's asking how many students are at the elementary school. Okay. I don't have it in front of me. Okay. All right. So please, please hold your comments, people. Uh, crowd, we, we need to be able to work here. I appreciate it. Okay, so I'd like to better understand that. I'd also like to understand the, th the thing that Mr. Rosenthal was asking about, and I think to his satisfaction, well, I guess I need to see a picture of it, of how, of, of the, the progression of when these changes took place between elementary, middle, and elementary and middle, and all those changes so that I can understand how many children are, were moved and are being moved again. Because it's also part of policy FC. I mean, do we know that? Maybe you know that already. Mm -hmm. Scott has the numbers of students that have been moved um, with the, the move of shift from Baines to First Colony, First Colony back to Baines. Is that, I want to clarify, is that what you're asking? How many yeah, times? Yeah, I, I guess I... I guess I'd like let's start with that. I mean, I don't I don't have the numbers in front of me, but the 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 last change before uh, Baines back to Thornton was Baines to First Colony, and that was in 2012-13. But they've been at First Colony, and now they've moved back to Baines when Thornton opened. Right. So I'm, I, what I guess what I'm saying is they they would not have moved twice. Right, but if we're moving them to a new place, then they're essentially moving twice because they went back to a school. They went to a school and they thought they were going one place, and now they're moving to a different place. That's right. just please hold that's your not, applause. It's not in fact moving them, but it is essentially moving okay. them because in their mind they were planning to go from one middle school to a high school, and now we're changing their trajectory. Okay. So let me. Okay, so. I don't this these are children we are talking about and it is very important to me that we we do the very best we can to provide them a consistent and reliable educational experience and when we move them from place to place please hold your applause and when we move them from place to place, it impacts them. We may be able to say we provide great educational services here and great educational services here, but it is not the same in their minds because they have to move mentally from one expectation to another expectation. It impacts families. Mrs. Tossan talked about kids, some kids go into this school, some kids go into that school. It impacts everything about their educational experience, their transportation. Let me bring up a point. We can sit here in this meeting and we can say, well, don't worry, you can be grandfathered into this school and you can be grandfathered into that school. Well, that, that's great for the people who can drive their kids when they're in high school and pick them up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon or 2.45, but that's not reality for a lot of families. And I don't think that 
you know, I think it's, it might be good as a short-term solution, but it is not a long-term solution to make, f to make it work for families and to be best for the families and for the kids impacted. So sorry to get off on that tangent, but I, I really don't. I really don't like this. Please hold your applause. Let me, I'd like to follow up on another thing that Mrs. Tossan said. I, I didn't quite understand it. You, you were talking a little bit about a portion of students in Siena South. And I think that what you were maybe saying was, is that a, a, a development or a portion of a development or a self-contained area of development it's new build in the back it's new build in the back of sienna south so one of the questions or one of the proposals is to leave everyone who's currently where it's currently developed in place and when there's new development which the new new development is going on in sienna south if we can get the map back up south of ridge point really all around ridge point and so the question is, can the, the new development in the back of Siena be rezoned temporarily until the new high school gets open? Okay, I understand what you're saying, and there's a certain number of students in there. The My question was how many, because we weren't, I don't think so, we have those numbers. So right now, um, it's planning unit two, 258B, which is where Thornton and Leonetti is. It's, it's, it doesn't have any students in it as of right now. It's projected to have about 205 years and 650 in 10 years. So it doesn't help relieve Ridge Point currently? It's not enough. Okay, that was my question. Okay. Uh, I didn't hear the number. I'm sorry, I was distracted. Sure. Um, the, the current number is zero students, the five-year number is 197, and the 10-year number is 647. Okay, so the answer right now is it's zero, so it, it's an area that could be placed there to help at the far end or at the middle mid-range in terms of numbers of students at Ridge Point. Correct. Okay. It's so just, it's not enough by itself to get Ridge Point to maintain its current levels. I understand that, but I think it would be worth considering, and I, I like Mrs. Tossan, would like to see the projections with, as that, as, with that under consideration. Uh, the next thing I'd like to say is that um, Mrs. Tossan also made it, uh, an interesting, uh, some commentary about programs being portable and but at the same time we have to consider programming when we're considering um, these issues and I it's you know our policy says one thing and absolutely this is focused on facilities use but our number one role um, and we learned about this last week at our uh, training that we all went to in Austin, and that is um, impacting student achievement. Because our number one job is to impact student achievement. So I appreciate you bringing that up because it's a balance. And when we, I'm about to make a speech, by the way. And, <laughs> and when we, um, did our massive district-wide boundary process. One of the uh, things we did is we looked at the entire district and very um, ably led by Mrs. Martinez, broke it into planning units, went over the entire district, balanced enrollment, and projected that out for a long period of time. And during that process, one of the main things we thought about was, or we tried to keep in mind, is that looking ahead, all of our schools were equal. They were of equal value and of equal value to the community and that they were able to all achieve great things. And I think that one of the biggest um, elephants in the room, if you will, if we can use that term, 
is to say that that's not the situation that we're in right now because we're struggling with a couple of schools. Um, their numbers are down and their student achievement numbers aren't what we hoped they would be when we did this massive rezoning back in 2015. And we can arguably, arguably say that some of the high tower numbers aren't what we'd like them to be also. And that's right now one of the biggest roadblocks to our decision making. Well, it's not a roadblock to our decision making process, but it's a, it's a huge impact on it because we can't treat all the high schools in the same way and we can't just say, let's rebalance all of this and save ourselves however many hundred million dollars it would, it's going to take to build, the new, build a new high school, we can't do that because we're, we, we've got to work with, um, with the high schools that are uh, having trouble with their student achievement. Um, and I guess, you know, I wish that, number one, I wish that wasn't so, and I wish we could, uh, you know, I wish we could find those things that would help those um, help those schools. We've had tremendous leadership turnover. I think that's been an impact, um, and we're struggling to find the right programming. And I know, Dr. Dupree, you're bringing things to us tonight that are going to maybe impact that student programming and help with that, and, and I'm hopeful that that will um, move us in the right direction. Um, but I just want to bring that up because that's the, bottom, that's the bottom line here, that if we had excellent student achievement at Marshall High School and at Willow Ridge High School and at the zone students at Hightower High School, this conversation would not be difficult at all. Please hold your applause. Look, it lets me stop and pause for a breath, so I didn't mind it that much. Um, Okay, so I guess I need more information on the feeder splits and I need to study that. And, and, I'd, and it's not in the slides, but I'd like to put that out to the public if we can post that as well with the uh, presentations or information so the public can see that. It applies also, I think, at the elementary boundary conversation that we discussed earlier. I, f I failed to ask it then, but I will. I, w I would like to look at it. Then I'd also like to know about the students in shift and their multiple moves. I'd like to know about the worst case scenarios, the number of students impacted, and have a better understanding of that. And if some folks have time to go over that with me this week, I would appreciate it. And Thank I'll you, Mrs. rest for the moment. Thank you, Mrs. James. Mrs. Helliger. Yeah, I just had one last question around um, the recommendations for tonight, and I do appreciate everyone's comments. I'm, I'm in alignment with a lot of what you, your speech on, on the mountaintop. Um, so, however, just for clarification for me, I'm looking at page 13, I believe, is the right page. Because uh, I'm still challenged that we're not looking at programming with this utilization. So is there a reason why we didn't change any of the boundaries for Marshall High School? So with Marshall, the projection is it's going, if you look at live-in, the projection is not to decline. And some of the very uh, reasons that Ms. James brought up in terms of really making sure that we have mm -hmm programming in place that is enriching to the students. I know you'll hear a presentation in, in a little bit um, to make sure that, um, you know, that we're able to provide that level of programming and that we have the um, evidence to support that. When we, when we came to the board however many years ago and asking, that was the board's concern in, in making those decisions around drawing new boundaries and moving students to schools. And while I know uh, the academic affairs group and Department of School Leadership and the campuses have made great improvements, we want to be able to, to initiate those improvements as we plan to in the coming year and, and subsequent years to be able to have that proof to bring to the board and to bring to parents and students and show the good things that are happening in those instructional settings. So that's 
I think the other um, aspect of that response, Ms. Helliger, is that um, the community feedback led toward the opening of the high school 12. Mm -hmm. And that results in minimal impact on everybody outside of Hightower and Ridge Point. And you know, Marsh, or excuse me, Willow Ridge is included in this because of their declining enrollment. So that's why we wanted to move parks. We're proposing moving parks into that zone. But Marshall, with the program, we expect to get to the 80% goal that the board established last year. Okay. All right. So that, I guess that clears clears it up because I am I was I'm still confused about boundaries versus programming programming not with boundaries. So if I'm confused, I'm sure there's a lot of people in the audience that's confused about it because it doesn't seem like we're applying it at the same time in the same places. So that's why. Okay, thank you. I do just want to let me just address that quickly because the numbers you're seeing do not include any academies. That was intentional. That's what I opened with mm -hmm. because we agree that policy says that the programming is portable. And so that's why we wanted you to see the impact of the zoning, this proposal, without programs at all. Okay, so without having the current enrollment or current projections without the proposed recommendations in front of me, it's hard for me to see that and to address it. But these, the proposed recommendations that we're showing on page 13 is based on, if I'm correct, based on your proposals tonight, correct? Correct. Okay, so I can't see what the current, the original yeah. utilization, if we don't do anything, what does that look like? I don't have that in front of me. So maybe that would have helped because then I could have saw that there was a 45% declining. So page what nine, slide page nine, nine okay. shows you in the current as is with no changes. Okay, that helps, okay. So I, I didn't see that. Six, seven, eight. Uh, nine. Okay, I took it out, that's why. Okay, <laughs> that helps. Okay, so based on doing doing absolutely nothing with Willow Ridge, we have a, a significant, almost a 10% decline from 55% to 45%. Marshall High School, there's no really no new net change. Okay, and so that's the only reason why we're impacting that change to Willow Ridge High School. Okay, all right, thanks. Yes, that's correct. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I will say, let me just add, this is not easy. And, you know, I get, te we, everyone's getting texts, we're getting your emails. Um, and to Mrs. James' comments and Mrs. Tossan's comments, you know, our children are very important to all of us. And at the end of the day, we want to make the best decisions and your feedback is helpful because it helps me to especially in the areas that i don't live i don't see that kind of thing really see some of the the concerns and um, possible other options that are currently out there so i do appreciate the comments that um that are, the respectful ones at least <laughs> um that are that are that are, prov are provided to us because it does kind of help me look at look through things at a different lens and i personally through this process did not get involved with the the zoning prior to the 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 information that was presented to us on, on Friday. And the reason why is because I really wanted to be extremely objective because the district's job was to go out and do the work. And as board members, we are supposed to review that information, get the impact you know, um, from the work that you all provided, and then you know, work with the community to make sure that we make the best decisions. There's, just like Ms. Um, James said, there's still some questions that I, I have. Um, so I won't, you know, make a judgment call on what I think about these proposals, but um, there's still more work for me to do, and I think for us as a board to do to make a, you know, to do the vote, yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. Ms. James. Thank you, Mr. Verdeen, and I uh, appreciate your comments, Ms. Helliger, because that's true. We have, um, it, it's been beneficial to get feedback from the community. Um, it's not beneficial to get cut and pasted emails. It is beneficial to get 
uh, thoughtfully written emails, and I've responded to several of those, uh, including um, a lovely lady who gave me a lesson in statistics in the last two days. So that was really, and it was very, it was actually very helpful. So I appreciate that. Um, I, I want to comment on something else, though, related to something you said earlier in the programming and programs, and, and this is just for the board's consideration. This is kind of a higher level concept. Um, but maybe it's time that we're starting to think less. I guess what I'm saying is maybe going forward we need to think about some revisions to policy FC local, and we need to have maybe less of a mindset of kids uh, kids in seats and a little more of a mindset of programming and innovative programming and visionary programming and I say this because it's kind of come up a little bit tonight but it also came up when we were doing the facilities master planning process and we talked about different types of innovative program that we'd be doing and as we're starting to see the administration come forward with plans for that maybe we need to think about revising FC local to take that into account. Um, so that's just something um, to throw out there. And one of the reasons that I feel so strongly, I guess, about innovative programming and different types of programming is because I really do believe that kids learn differently. They learn differently than certainly when I was in school and even differently than when my own kids that are just now in college um, were in school. And I wonder if, because of that, their engagement in the learning process, um, we struggle to keep them engaged um, more uh, in this kind of environment, learning environment that they're in. And I wonder if that impacts our discipline and our classroom management and our student behaviors. And um, I know we're trying some innovative curriculum measures and we're trying some new things in the classrooms and I appreciate um, the academics department and instructional staff that's working on that. <clears throat> but I just wonder if there's a correlation betwi between this um, kind of kids in seats mentality uh, and really what <laughs> students need in their educational program going forward. And so I'd like to kind of get ahead of that and I think maybe a first step would be uh, revision to FC local. This is Tall Sand. I, I, I just want to um, agree with that. And we've done some great things with literacy, and we've done some great things with early intervention for our students with disabilities. And so, thinking through that, I would hate for those programs to be moved because we're looking more at kids in seats. So, as we think through that, I, I, I would agree with that, which is why I asked earlier about a, a plan a programming plan because if we for example I know some of the community members came up with the uh, a, a law Academy at Thurgood Marshall High School um, which being a lawyer I think that's fantastic but what I would hate to see is in the future if something like that would get moved because we're looking at um, zoning and and the so I personally think high school should be done completely differently I think everybody knows that I've talked about that a lot that I think our kids, you know, carry these things around and walls do not define them anymore. And so I think programs should define our kids and their educational experience and not so much maybe the seats and the walls. I, I, I truly believe that's the future. Um, so I think that's where we need to start looking and maybe a change in policy is how we do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Tossan. Um, I'll just finish with this, that uh, we had a lot of good conversation tonight. We have some more information to review in the next week, and I look forward to getting that. Um, I wanted to thank my fellow volunteers, my fellow board members, for their hard work and the time that you know, we've spent on this. And uh, I wanted to thank staff as well. You've uh, A lot of you have worked over Christmas. Um, you've sacrificed your family, and, and uh, we appreciate that. And I just wanted to make the comment as well that None of us as board members want to be sitting here having to do this. Um, fortunately, as we're able to travel around the country, um, we are a growing district, although growing districts have to rezone. That's just part of it. And something that I'm very proud of in Fort Bend ISD, which we do not have to do, 
when it comes to rezoning is engage the community because we could just do it however we see fit to do it. And so I'm proud that we go out in the community and we ask because we do not have to do that. And, um, and it's not easy and we take a lot of ridicule for it, but I challenge everyone that's here to, uh, to not just, and I'm not accusing anyone of this, but to point the finger and say, why not them? But help us come up with some solutions because we don't have all the answers. There's not a magic bullet. Staff doesn't have all the answers. So that's very helpful. Um, that was mentioned, Mrs. James and, and Mrs. Tawson mentioned that. If there's any, anything that you can see that we don't see, please communicate that with us. Um, thank you all. We will now convene in closed session. When we come back from closed session, we will then view the other agenda items, some of them being uh, in regards to programs. So, all right. We will now convene in closed session under the Texas Open Meetings Act, Chapter 551, and those sections listed in the agenda for the purpose and private consultation with the board's attorney on any or all subject matters authorized by law. We are now convening closed session.